So welcome everybody to our CAT conference on a Tuesday. Today we have Matias, uh, who is the director of Valve and Structural in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And Matias is one of the people who's really been pushing the sort of not minimalistic tower, ultra minimalistic tower. So I don't know what ultra minimalistic tower means. You go from the radial now or, and you send the patient home right after the procedure, but we're gonna learn about it. And we hope to learn from you, Matthias, how you've been able to introduce this into your practice. Thank you so much. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you, Asim. For me, it's a, it's a real pleasure, this invitation, uh, because it's a big opportunity uh, for us and uh, for our uh, practice in, in Latin America to show and share with you what we are doing to try to minimize um, the impact of, uh, of, uh, of long-term hospitalization and also um, to show how we do to, to improve the pathway uh, in the hospital of our patients. So thank you very much. Uh, and. Um, and we are going to, to go to the, the topics. Um, these are, are my disclosures. And this is, slide is very well known for all, all of you. Um, why, the, the question is, why do we need minimalistic procedure? And uh, you know that the number of tabers is rising rapidly, but also the number of other in, uh, structural, um, structural procedures are rising. So we need to be very dynamic to, to try to reach more number of patients uh, and, and uh, we need to treat more number of patients in the future. So uh, that is a very actual topic. What are the major problems during COVID pandemic? Um, and this is a problem in Latin America and I think that is also in Europe and also in uh, USA. And first, the patients don't want to go to the hospital, and even more, they don't want to go to the unit, uh, coronary unit or uh, intensive care units. There are uh, a limitation of bed available for cardiological procedures, and this is an important thing that it's happened now in Argentina and also in Latin America. And there are some parts of the team under quarantine, and this is another problem. So we have to lead with all of uh, topics to try to, to keep our program, uh, TABER program uh, ongoing. Who should go to urgent TABER uh, in COVID peak? So we have to identify those patients that need um, uh, urgent TABER and uh, who we cannot postpone the procedure. Obviously those are the emergent or patients with cardiogenic shock, acute refractory heart failure, but also there are patients that have sign, signs, uh, clinical signs and, and, and symptoms that we should address. Uh, the patient who has a recent or recurrent heart, heart failure, hospitalization, and also exertional syncope, um, patients that have sign, uh, some signs in the echo as mean gradient more than 50 millimeters of mercury or velocities more than 4.5 or 5 or very small areas, they should not be postponed. On the other hand, there are some patients with uh, mild symptoms or the patients that are truly asymptomatic with very severe aortic stenosis that we can postpone for uh, 5, 12 weeks. But I, 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 I should say that uh, we recommend a serial close clinical follow-up by telephone or telemedicine of this uh, patient that we are going to postpone. So we have to keep an eye on those patients that we are going to postpone. What are, uh, doctors and what institution needs during this time? So uh, we need to improve the patient, the patient flows in the institution, be safer and also faster. Safer and faster is uh, one of the, the most important things. Reduce days of hospitalization, reduce the clinical impact of long-term hospitalization if we need it, some or better outcomes, uh, cost reductions, and also no waiting list. On the other hand, what the patient wants. They, wants, uh, they, they don't matter if there are COVID uh, uh, pandemic time or not. They want perfect results. 
Also, they want same invasivity of a regular PCI. This is a common conversation uh, when I'm talking with the patients. They always ask me if it's the same uh, invasivity of, of a PCI. They don't want general anesthesia, but also, but also they don't want to feel pain. They want fast return to daily life. Uh, we are treating now patients that uh, are low risk. So they are working, they have a daily life, active daily life. They want short hospitalization time. And obviously they don't want COVID infection during hospitalization. That is another problem. So I, I would like to show you this picture of uh, our team uh, 10 years ago, when we start uh, with uh, Taber, our Taber program, uh, this is a typical picture uh, of all uh, cat lab centers 10 years ago with sharing anesthesia, transesophagical echo. We uh, were four, four or five operator scrubs, 10 persons at least in the cat lab, very busy cat lab, pacemaker lead always in the right, right chamber of the patient, always. The, all the procedures um, were performed by, by cut down and at least 48 hours of uh, ICU hospitalization. And also the patient was under immobilization for 48 hours at least. This is uh, one of uh, our picture of our team uh, one week ago. This is uh, the setting of our cat lab. We use conscious sedation. Uh, we were using uh, dexmetomedine, but honestly, we switch the dexmetomedine for uh, fentanyl, and that is why the dexmetomedine effect lasts for four or five hours, and uh, we need to detect conduction of abnormalities, and sometimes the dexmetomedine um, is uh, too bradycardia, uh, produced uh, too much bradycardia, so we are switching for on only fentanyl. We do not use uh, regularly transesophagical echo. We try to no use Foley catheters, always two operator screw, no, no more than two in, 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 co in COVID time. Uh, we try to use uh, no central venous access, 100% um, of the patient if it's possible. And, and then we are going to talk when not, but we are trying to use wire pacing in all patients, ProGlide, ProStar, or Manta device uh, uh, every uh, as, as you want, you can use either one or another, and if possible, one single access or uh, use uh, the radial access as, as contralateral access. Um, uh, as, as a rule, we try to um, get off the patient of the cat blood without no sheets in the groin after procedure. So to do that, we have to set uh, the patient before the tower. And it's very important in COVID time to, to make a setting with the patient and also with the family. So we're planning with the family some things uh, before the procedure. We prepare the family for early discharge. We uh, ask if uh, the patient needs a caretaker or not. We sense also if there are any barriers to do so. So if there are any barriers, maybe we wait to resolve these barriers to prepare the patient for, uh, uh, um, for early discharge. We are uh, always um, promote the same admission day for the patient, make sure that the patient brings the special medication. And this is uh, an important point. Uh, if, if the patient use uh, CPAP, we try that patients brings uh, his own CPAP and his own setting of the CPAP and uh, do the overnight of the, in, in the hospital with his CPAP. Uh, the pre-anesthetic consultation in case of rep or re or respiratory or chronic pain also is important, but we do not use a pre-anesthetic consultation for all the patients, only for, with those with a, a, a respiratory or chronic pain management. And another important uh, topic is to be prepared for the permanent pacemaker implantation if needed. I don't know if uh, it is a problem in USA or in Europe, but I, I, I will say that in Latin America, uh, the hospital do not have in the stock permanent pacemaker. So uh, if, if, if we um, schedule a procedure, we need to have with uh, the patient the device assigned for it. 
to to try to do not lose time in us uh, for the insurance for the pacemaker if if we don't need the pacemaker we return it but uh, we need to to admit the patient with the pacemaker in case of needed so the the minimalistic pathway uh, continue after the proce procedure and we promote in all patients early intake of solid food, stand up three hours post uh, procedure. Um, we try to uh, promote ambulation six hours post procedure. Uh, it's, it's very easy if the patient has only one groin uh, puncture, uh, it's easy and the patient feels more comfortable. We try to transfer the patients to room with TV, windows, and this uh, is, is, is well known that it's better to avoid disorientation. And uh, also in this uh, time of uh, COVID uh, pandemic, it's very important. And we also put one member of the family in the room with the patient if the patient is, is elderly. Um, for that, we test for, uh, we do PCR uh, testing COVID for uh, the patient and also for the family who is going to be in the room with the patient. And also we prepare the, the patient uh, for the early discharge and the family uh, after the procedure. This is our patient, one of our patient uh, um, taking solid food one hour post procedure. This is another stand up uh, making pee, and this is the same patient uh, day before the procedure going home. Um, all of this is, is very interesting, but we need to 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 know what are the patients that we have a take an eye and do not uh, make minimalistic procedure. What are the patients who are not good candidate for that? Uh, this is not uh, rigid. Uh, these criteria are not rigid. We can be so um, permitted, but uh, we we ha we have to 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 analyze uh, very careful this alternative access. Uh, in the case of our center, when we use subclavian access, uh, we uh, we use general anesthesia. And we are still uh, doing um, cut down for for uh, for subclavian access in those patients that are very morbid, obese, and um, it's it's not a rule, but maybe a general anesthesia is uh, more comfortable for the patient. That is another important point. If the patient um, has at risk of very high risk of coronary obstruction, maybe we can start with minimalistic procedure, but we have be prepared to escalate for intubation or for uh, for drugs infusions. So maybe at, in, in those patients, we need a central uh, venous access. Barriers to emergent intubation, that is a, a important another important point. Um, intoler intolerable chronic pain, altered mental status, not good candidate from transphagical echo, and shock, obviously shock uh, for me, is the is, is is one of the most important um, uh, clinical situation uh, in, in when we don't have to be minimalistic. So, if the patient doesn't meet all these criteria, we use conscious sedation, and then we transfer the patient to uh, a non ICU ward only for telemetry. But uh, if the patient meets any of these criteria, we use uh, general anesthesia, and then after the general anesthesia, we transfer the patient to an ICU ward. And also if we use conscious sedation, but the patients finish the procedure unstable hemodynamically, or uh, we had a vascular uh, or a neurological complication, or uh, we have an unstable rhythm conduction, also we put the patient in the ICU ward. And this has not changed in uh, has not changed in in this pandemic uh, covid uh, time I, I i would like to share with you this uh, initial experience that uh, was not done during uh, covid time but it's a latin american experience um, maybe it's very different that uh, we uh, that uh, you do in USA on Europe, but uh, it's our data, I, and I would like to share with you. In this treatment registry, um, we aim to compare the safety and the efficacy of patients undergoing tram femoral TAVI 
with minimalistic approach to those with the standard approach. We collect 1,133 patients from four Latin American countries and seven centers. And this is from 2009 to 2018, almost 10 years collecting patients um uh, the safety and the efficacy outcomes were evaluated uh, 30 days according to the bark 2 criteria uh, now i have to say that we are going to use the bark 3 criterion but um uh, look at the at the chart of the distribution of the device used and this is the reality in latin america the majority of device was corval the classic corval and, and there are uh, then uh, share but Sapien XT, Accurate Neo, Evolute, Sapien 3, and Lotus 7. But look, the, the, the numbers of Sapien 3 and Evolute are, are very, very low. That is because we start using uh, S3 and also Evolute R in 2017. So we found that the, um, the the patients that we use a standard approach was uh, elderly, also was uh, sicker, more NIH4 class, uh, also was more emergency procedures, uh, as, as, as it's obvious. And also we have measured bleedings and measured vascular complication. Uh, I, 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 I have to say that all the patients that we use standard approach were more sicker. And that's the reason why we have a major bleeding and major vascular complications. Um, on the other hand, if, if we see the length of stay, we have reduced, dramatically reduced, the days of ICU uh, hospitalization and also the total days of hospitalization. But it's still very, very high, the ICU days, two days in the, in the minimalistic approach versus 4.3 days in the standard approach. So, we have too much work to do in Latin America uh, with, with these uh, numbers. And if we um, watch what was the need of conversion to general anesthesia, the percentage of uh, need for uh, conversation, uh, com conversion to general anesthesia was 3.8, and the significant predictor for turnover was uh, worse New York Health uh, Association class, peripheral vascular disease, and those procedures that was eco-guided. And the major causes for, for turnover, the first was uh, repress, uh, respiratory depression, hemodynamic causes, major vascular complications, and need for transphagical deco. I would like to share another uh, local uh, experience um, that uh, was published by, by Oscar Mendes, he's a friend and also is a mentor that uh, Asim Latif uh, know very well. And I would like to show uh, his, uh, his experience because a single center experience uh, in one person that has a lot of experience in, in, in Latin America. And he shows a retro, re, retro, retrospective non-randomized observational study and compare 30 days outcomes of the minimalistic approach versus a standard approach for TAVI performing a single center. He collects 303 patients and uh, 75 patients were under minimalistic approach and 74 patients with uh, standard approach, 24%. And he found the same. The procedural duration uh, was uh, less in the minimalistic approach and also the length of stay was less. So there are not any doubt that uh, the minimalistic approach uh, reduced the length of stay and that is a very important topic to apply in COVID time is one of the most important uh, in my opinion. This is a, a picture of a patient that we treat uh, one month ago um, in Argentina. We are during the peak. So the, this patient was treated during a peak, a COVID peak. And, and we are uh, trying to, to, um, to do this pathway. We admit the patient at the same day. We implant uh, any valve as a core valve. In this case, was a, a Cimetis. Um, we discharged this patient, 92 years old, next day of the procedure, and all the follow-up, all the follow-up of this lady was doing by telemedicine. Uh, a technician uh, was uh, uh, went to his house and performed an AKG and also performed an echo. So the patient uh, do not return to the hospital anymore. And now. 
I would like to talk for uh, this uh, term ultra minimalistic that uh, is, uh, is, is some um, way to do the procedure using uh, only one uh, arterial access. Um, I will, this is our, this are one of the pictures of the, of the technique, but I would like to show you a video. It's a 10 minute video. Um, so we started doing a very uh, obsessive puncture. And this is one of the most important part of the, of the procedure. Uh, if you want to do ultra minimalistic obsession with the puncture echo guided in the anterior wall of the artery. Um, once we do um, the obsessive, I say obsessive arterial puncture, we um, place a proglide. And this is another topic of uh, discussion that uh, is, is very actual. If uh, one proglide, two proglide. So if I would uh, use two proglides, I, I, if, if I, I could use two proglides, I could use to provide because uh, in my opinion is 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 safer uh, but um, we are using now one proglide and we have a very good experience using one but um, I, I i have to say that for use one proglide you have to be sure that you puncture in the anterior wall and in, in in a in a place that there are not calcium spots so after uh, meticulous uh, um, puncture and and um, and the use of one proglide, we insert this um, this sheet that is the ice lift sheet. The ice lift is 14 French uh, uh, sheet that had uh, three folds that it 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 fold folding open during the the valve uh, passage through the the sheet. So we can advance it. It's very slippery. The hydrophilic coating is very nice. And once we place the, um, the ice lip sheet, we advance a pigtail to assess uh, the implanting position. This technique uh, can be used only with accurate. Um, I, I, I didn't try with another uh, valve, but um, for, for accurate valve, we are still using three cast view. So once we are sure that we are going to use a three cast view and this uh, view is okay for us, um, then we uh, pass through the, the valve with the regular wire. In this case, it's a, it's a hydrophilic wire. So we, we pass the, the, through the aortic valve as, uh, as usual. In this case, with the IL-1 catheter. And then we exchange um, with, uh, with a pigtail to, to be very, um, very safety in the apex with a pigtail and also to do hemodynamics. So once we have the pigtail in the apex, uh, at that time we can do hemodynamics. We have two uh, pressure uh, sources. One is the catheter in the apex of the ventricle and the other source of pressure is the collateral flash of the, of the sheet. Uh, after that, uh, the technique continue placing a safari wire or any wire, the wire that you are uh, using uh, for chaber, we use for, for, um, for accurate always safari small wire. Um, after we place the, the, the safari wire, we proceed with the wire pacing valvuloplasty. Uh, as, as you can see, there are not uh, any other puncture in the groin, and also there are not venous access and there are not pacemaker uh, in the right chamber. So at that point, we are going to do wire pacing. We attach uh, an alligator in the skin and we attach the black alligator uh, in the tip of the, of the wire. And then we do wire, uh, wire pacing valvuloplasty. For, for this, we, we, we need to have the maximum output in the, in the, in the pacemaker and also the, the, val, the wire have to be in contact with the ventricle. After that, we are prepared to advance the device. So um, for, for this, it's important to, to, to know that uh, the valve has to be advanced until the abdominal aorta is rigid. We are going to know that the abdominal aorta is rigid because we are, are doing a fluoro, but also because we are going to take pressure 
in the collateral flash. After that, and this is the same concept of the impeller and, and, and the same 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 puncture impeller. We make a puncture in the in the side of the of the bulb of the sheet, and then we can advance a pigtail, or also we can put a five frame sheet and then advance the pigtail. Uh, when we put the pigtail in the no coronary senus, we advance the device as 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 ever as uh, as always. And this maneuver can be done um, by one hand, like a PCI uh, taking the wire uh, as the pigtail as a wire, and then we proceed uh, with the with the implantation of the accurate valve. This valve, uh, you you need to rotate the knot one to open the um, the upper crown. And then, if you are fine with the with the position, you can still continue opening the stabilization arches in, in the um, ascending aorta, uh, as in this case. Uh, if you are happy, uh, you take out the safety button and proceed with the open of the um, of the lower part of the valve. Um, so, if you are happy. Uh, with the position, you retrieve the nose cone, as in the as in the um, in the video. It's, it's easy uh, to do that with the pigtail uh, in the same sheet. There are not any friction. It's, it's really trust in me. It's it's, it's easy, um, but you can't uh, take out the delivery system with the pigtail. So first, you have to take out the pigtail, the contralateral pigtail. Um, before retrieving the delivery system. So at that time, we are retrieving the delivery system. And it's, uh, it's important to say that for, for that device, we need to keep the wire always in the ventricle. So this is the Safari wire that is in the ventricle, and we are going to repuncture the value of the sheet to put uh, the pigtail again to make uh, an angio and assess what the valve, uh, if the valve needs a post dilatation and also assess hemodynamics. But uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to work uh, with two catheters by the same sheet. So we are advancing now the, the contralateral pigtail. I suggest always to use a five French because if you use six French, you are going to feel some friction. Um, so we have the pigtail in the in the ascending aorta, and then we are going to place another pigtail uh, into the ventricle and take out the safari wire and assess uh, the result of uh, the valve. So if 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 we need to do a post dilatation is very easy to put uh, by by uh, by this uh, by this sheet uh, another balloon and make the valvuloplasty even with the with the five French catheter at the side. So we will rule out the 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 procedure the the results and if it's okay we take out all catheters. But uh, before closure the artery, uh, I, I think that it's important uh, to be safe. Um, to be safe, we keep a wire uh, through the vessel when we try when we retrieve the the sheath, and we do a partial closure of the knob of the proglide. Um, we do not take out the wire any time of the vessel, so. We make a partial closure of the of the proglide, and that, that is a very important question because too much people ask me about the bailout if we have vascular complications, and then we insert uh, a micropuncture catheter or dilator to assess the status of the femoral artery um, before closing and before transfer the patient to um, the ward. So if it's okay, we will try everything and we finally close the proglide and that is all the procedure. So um, 
I would like to show you uh, one initial experience with this technique that uh, is called all-in-one. Uh, we collect cases uh, with uh, another physician in Argentina that is uh, Romina Carla Gatielo, and also with Stefan Towelberg in Lucerne in Canton Hospital in Switzerland. Uh, nowadays, we have more than 10, um, sorry, more than 100 patients with this technique, but uh, this initial experience uh, is when uh, with 24 patients compare, uh, in only one technique compared with 24 patients in standard technique. Um, really, the, 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 the baseline and process characteristic of what the same, this is, was the sheet usage. Uh, the majority of the sheet usage was isolated, but also lots of small, and in one patient transglide. Um, we have found that the procedural duration is less, and also the closure device uses I less. Are, are less. Um, but the most important thing that is the major vascular complication of major life treating doesn't change using one technique or another. So I, I can say that this uh, approach is safe and effective, but obviously we need more number of patients. I, I would like to show you another ultra minimalistic, uh, it's minimalistic or ultra minimalistic, but it's with another device, it's with Evolute uh, bulb. And we can also uh, be minimalistic using other devices. Uh, this is an 80 years old woman uh, with hypertension, the lipidemia. Uh, she started with exceptional dignity and chest pain during park walking two months before consulting us. She lived herself and was able to perform activities of the daily life, slightly uh, impaired um, uh, renal function. Um, he had breast cancer. 11 years ago with chemotherapy and radiotherapy, et cetera. And also um, very severe aortic stenosis with a mean gradient of 40 millimeters. Um, so it's important to assess for this patient, the basal AKG. And as you can see here, there are not any conduction abnormalities, more than, uh, it's, it's, it's almost a normal, uh, AKG for a lady of uh, more than 80 years. So this is a very, very important uh, aspect in the minimalism. So this is the echo gradient, uh, the coronary are uh, the, the patient doesn't have a severe lesion. And these are the hemodynamics uh, pre-procedure, as you can see here, uh, very severe aortic stenosis with pit gradient more than six millimeters. In the CT of the patient, we detect that uh, this patient has a very small annulus, uh, less than 300 millimeters square of area and perimeter of 62 millimeters. Uh, the height of the left main is 9.8, less than uh, 10 millimeters, and also the right coronary is 30 uh, millimeters of height. So we are um, seeing a very small annulus patient and also the average of the sinus wide are 25. So the annulus is small, the coronary height is small, and also the, um, the sinus of, of Valsalva is small. As uh, we can predict also the peripheral viscer are small. So we call this a tower in, in small anatomy. Um, we are uh, trying to do also uh, minimalistic pathway in this uh, small anatomy um, patient. So what, uh, how we approach these patients, um, in this patient, unfortunately, we couldn't use the radial or, uh, left um, because the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and also the right radial. So we make a, a, a same puncture in, in, in the same side of the femoral artery. And this is the pre-dilatation with a non-compliant balloon um, 18. As, as you can see, we use a uh, cusp overlap in uh, every patient that we use Corval. And we are doing wire pacing. We do not place uh, a pacemaker in, in, the, in the right chambers, in the right ventricle. Um, we continue with the, with the implantation, nothing very interesting. Uh, we place it in, in cast overlap. During the final release of the valve, we use uh, rapid pacing uh, using wire pacing. 
And then this is the final result. This is one minute uh, after the procedure. This is the more dynamics. And also we try to perform the AQC in the cat lab to assess if there are any um, transient or any uh, other conduction abnormality. And that is important to decide the pathway of the, of the patient and look how change the, um, the autogram uh, five minutes uh, after the procedure. So the, the, um, the leak is very, very mild. So what are the pathway of this patient? The patient go out of the cat lab without femoral sheet and transfer to the ward with telemetry overnight. We do AQC every four hours to assess conduction abnormality. We need to know and anticipate uh, conduction abnormalities. We, we don't like to see the conduction abnormalities 24 hours um, after the procedure. We, 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 we want to know in, in real time if there are any conduction abnormalities. And in this case, uh, the lady was far discharged next morning. Um, I, I, will, I would like to finish with this case that uh, is minimalistic case in patient with conduction abnormalities. Uh, we can do minimalistic even if the patient has conduction abnormalities. This is a male of 80 years old that have right bundle uh, branch block and first IV block, chronic kidney disease, mild cognitive impairment, severe autistic stenosis, no coronary lesion, and uh, intermediate risk score. Um, this is the AQC, as you can see here, the patient uh, has a uh, right bundle branch block and also uh, um, a BIB block um, of, of first degree. So this is a patient who we have to take care uh, in the uh, follow-up after the procedure. And this is the CT, the angio CT shows a big annulus, 88.8 uh, millimeters of perimeter, area of 630. Um, the uh, peripheral vessels are okay. So what was the planning with this uh, patient during COVID time? Admission at 7 a.m., cat lab at 8 a.m., conscious sedation, no foley catheters, um, predilatation with 23 balloon, taber with Evolutar 34, and AQC in the cat lab, and every four hours to detect abnormalities in conduction system. So this is the case, not important the answer, but uh, it's just to show the, the pathway. Uh, we all, we did it uh, with cast overlap and see how high is the valve. Um, we deployed the valve uh, very high. And I would like to remark that in these patients, we do put a pacemaker through sugular vein. We, knew, we do not do these patients under uh, wire pacing because it's unsafe. If we have any conduction abnormality during the procedure, we have to rush to gain a vein and put a pacemaker. So uh, we pre implant uh, a wire pacing, a uh, wire pacing, a pacemaker through the sugular vein. Um, this is the final result some leak, and, and it's, it's not the topic of this discussion. But look, uh, we were very, very, very high, but then the, the valve plays a little bit uh, deeper than we want. Um, look, the AQC in the cat lab, we can see that the QRS do not change, but there are uh, 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 maybe a little bit progression of the AB blocks. Um, we detect eight hours after TAVI during, during, during this uh, routinely four hours AQC, we detect some uh, bits that are blocked. So we proceed. Uh, in the afternoon with uh, the pacemaker implantation. So the pathway in the hospital of this patient is left the cat lab without femoral sheet, pacemaker by sugular approach, transferred to the ward with telemetry overnight, AQC every four hours to detect conduction abnormalities. And we detected, so we, uh, the PPM was implanted at 4 p.m. and the patient was fast discharged next morning. Uh, I would like to finish with that, with this uh, expression of the Antoni Sainz-Superi that say that perfection is achieved 
not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing uh, left to take away. Um, and also to finish this picture that was taken uh, in November uh, 2019, when I visit Asim in, in this fabulous and outstanding hospital that is Montefiore. But uh, this picture, as you can see, is, uh, is in not uh, pandemic time. So uh, I, I, I really hope to more moments that uh, like this, without mask, uh, without uh, virus, and, uh, and showing our daily life. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. And um, this last picture is from a very famous street in Buenos Aires that is called La Boca. La Boca is, is, is well known because there are a very no football team here that is Boca Junior. And uh, it's, it's very funny, the colors of the house. So thank you, Asim, for this invitation. And I'm open for discussion. Matthias, thank you so much. Um, you know, one of the things I've, I've really enjoyed about doing these CAS conferences is how we get to learn from colleagues all around the world. Uh, and really, you know, to think maybe 10, 15 years ago, you know, even five years ago, we wouldn't have had this opportunity to learn from your practice in Argentina and Buenos Aires, um, because I think you really are pushing, you know, the limits of, of how we can try and get our patients home sooner, how we make Tava become more like PCI as far as predictability, as far as uh, being invasive. And also, I want to congratulate you because you also collect your data. So you don't just talk about what you do, you collect your data, so you actually validate what you're saying with data, which I think is very important. You often hear people saying, ah, you know, I do this, I do that, but where's the data, right? So I, I always love the fact when I see people collect their own data because then you, you really are validating what you're doing. So thank you very much um, for that. I'm gonna have Manaf in a second, Manaf. I'm not sure if you're there and if, um, um, I don't see Sharon, um, maybe ask some questions. But one of the things, you know, we've been trying to push this sort of early discharge uh, and getting home, patients home the next day, right? Um, we, we don't do the single access. We prefer having a radial uh, as our second access because we believe radials are very minimally invasive, but also it gives us a nice bailout uh, if there's a vascular complication, you can easily get down, uh, manage the vascular complication from the radial if you have to. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. Um, but one of the things I've, I've learned is that you have to be very selective about the patients, right? And patient selection for early discharge is extremely important. Um, and so, you know, also you can decide, you, know, you see a patient, you think this patient's got good support, the ECG is normal. You also then have to be prepared to change if something changes in the cath lab, right? So if the patient then has first degree AV block or develops left bundle or develops, um, you know, temporary or transient complete heart block, you may have to change your approach. So I, don't, I wonder if you can comment maybe a little bit about patient selection. Do you have very strict criteria about who you select? That's my one question. And then my second question is in the patients you send home really early. I'm not sure if you've done any same day discharge, but do you bring them back within two or three days to check on them again? Or do you have nurses who are calling them in the first few days to make sure they don't have any issues? Okay, okay. I got, I got the two questions. Yes, the first, we, we, we are uh, very selective when we decide uh, to, to put this patient in the, in the pathway of early discharge. Um, first, we, we have to identify, obviously, uh, the clinical status. If the patient uh, is very frailty, it's, uh, th those patients that are very, very frailty maybe need one more day to walk around the, the, the room, to eat, uh, to feel more comfortable and, and gain com uh, confidence to go to home. Uh, those patients that are very filthy, I have to say honestly, that are not good candidate for fast discharge in, in, in the very early morning after procedure. Uh, 
and other 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 patients that are not eligible to fast discharge are, are those with uh, like this last case with uh, some conduction abnormality but you don't really want to be too aggressive with the indication of the pacemaker because everybody can indicate a pacemaker but uh, we need to identify what patient can even with a conduction abnormality do not receive the pacemaker so for those patients, maybe we wait more than 12 hours, more than 24 hours, and we have seen some improvement in the, in the, in the conduction abnormality during the hospitalization. Those with have progressed the AB block in 24 hours or 36 hours, maybe this progression of the uh, AB block regress reg and we don't need to put a pacemaker. Um, on the other hand, the patients that obviously during the procedure, we had some vascular complication and need transfusions or, or, or we need to repair uh, something. Obviously we, uh, we put this patient one day more. And another important uh, patients that we try to keep one day more are those with a low ejection fraction that uh, uh, we use um, um, inotropics during the procedure. Maybe we last more than 24 hours to discharge. Um, what was the second question, Asim? Sorry. Uh, no, that's fine. Don't worry. I mean, that's the, those were sort of the main questions I really wanted to understand uh, from you. I think patient selection is, is really fundamental um, to the success. So, yeah, the second question was really, how do you follow up patients, right? Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Do, are you, because the one, you know, we've thought a lot about uh, same day discharge, but then we feel very strongly if we're going to send the patient home the same day after Tava, we need to be able to bring the patient back the next day, at least, to recheck the groins, recheck the patient. Um, that's just how we felt. But I wonder what your thoughts were on uh, early discharge and follow up. Sure, sure. Uh, usually, we um, we make a follow up, telephoning follow up, the day after the tabi, and we see the patient 48 hours after the procedure in all patients. We repeat the AQC, and we uh, uh, make a clinical uh, assessment of the patient and also the groin. And that is uh, our regular practice. At uh, 48 hours after discharge, we see the patients. But um, in, in nowadays that are a, a huge peak of COVID, we try, uh, we, we did uh, a team with the technicians and uh, with, uh, with uh, ambulatory equipment that go to the home of the, of the, uh, of the patients and perform an AKG and also uh, an echocardiography if needed. Um, and, and that's, Maybe uh, can change if the, if if uh, if we resolve the peak, the pandemic peak. But uh, uh, we have two ways: one at home, and the second uh, uh, that I prefer is to see the patient for the forty-eight hours. The problem of the of of, of watching the, the patient at home is uh, that depends of the insurance of the patient. We don't, we we can't do it with all patients. Manaf? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, that was a great lecture and fascinating to see your approach. Um, I have a couple of sort of big picture questions. Um, one is, do you think that this approach should be um, sort of the, the goal that the TAVR program should be striving for? Or do you think that this is uh, something that is for select centers or maybe particular needs or particular um, resources or skill set of operators. And, um, and the second question is, uh, do you do this with, with trainees, with fellows um, in the room, uh, or does the, the presence of fellows change some of these um, streamlined pathways that you take, which can sometimes, um, you know, um, not bypass safety mechanisms, but, you know, they, they are a little bit um, uh, require a little bit more 
experience or sort of uh, uh, knowledge of the uh, the procedure above which you know fellows might have. So those are my two questions. Uh -oh. um, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I I think that um, maybe you can adopt uh, this technique as uh, a, 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 as your first approach if you feel com comfortable. If not. You can puncture uh, the other groin, or you can puncture the other uh, um, radial. But we have adopted as a, as, as our first approach um, because we feel comfortable. But there are an, an experience in Canada, uh, the center that uh, there are another colleague. The name is uh, Rodrigo Bagur. Then they have adopted this all-in-one technique in all patients as a default technique and uh, because they use the radial the right radial approach for cerebral protection device and they don't want to puncture another groin that uh, we know that there are complications uh, in the puncture of the contralateral groin there are not life threatening complications but are complications so uh, in in terms of uh, what to do you can do what you, you feel comfortable um, we adopted at, as as a, as a as a main procedure. There are some patients that we do not use this technique. And those patients that maybe we'll, we know that we will need a bailout uh, closure because there are too much calcification in, in the anterior wall of the, of the, of the artery and we'll need to place a balloon uh, in, in the femoral artery. And those patients we do not uh, select for this type of, of uh, approach. On the other hand, um, uh, your question about fellows. Yes, we uh, performed all this procedure with fellows and uh, always are scrubbed with us. Uh, there are not any limitations for do that uh, with our fellows. They do the same that we do. Thank you. And I, I, another question, if you were to take your, um, an average week or month, uh, how many, what percentage of patients in that month do you think you're doing this ultra minimalistic approach on? Um, most of them. Oh, really? Most of them. Most of them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, did you have a question? You know, in the meantime, I can tell you some of the comments that have came come up. You, you know, one of the comments is that you're making Tava look too easy, and now everybody's going to want to do Tava. Um, so I just want to reiterate to our colleagues that this, before Matthias started doing this, he did hundreds, if not thousands, of Tavas before, and has and has proctored Tava all over the world. But Matthias, yeah, I think you have to be careful. You're trying to you're trying to by being minimalistic, you're trying to minimize uh what you do <laughs> and the skills it takes but anyway sharon yes um hi thank you thank you for the for the talk uh, it's always interesting to hear uh, other people experience i i was wondering if you in case of a uh, vascular complication right how would you manage wh what would be your your strategy like access um Okay, the, bail the, the ba bailout uh, strategy. So, um, obviously, uh, we we try to 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 be safer, and we do not to push the the limits in in terms of safety. So, we try to maintain a wire through the vessel every time, every time, and never take out the the, the wire through the vessel because in case of rupture, dissection or anything, you have the access to put a, a balloon in the aorta or balloon in the iliac artery. Um, we, we make, uh, we put an eye, we try to analyze the contralateral femoral uh, by echo in case of we need to puncture. And honestly, if we have a bailout or if we have a complication, we the bailout strategy is to inflate the balloon and make a rapid puncture and the echo guided puncture of the contralateral femoral artery and work contralateral from uh, the other artery. This is our uh, uh, um, 
strategy. But uh, uh, to be honest, the best way to avoid complication is the initial part of the pressure that is obsessive. Puncher, guide the puncher in the anterior wall of the vessel and try to select patients with big diameters on the, on the femoral artery and the iliac artery. Prevention. So there are a couple of questions quickly from the chat, uh, Matthias. Um, the one is, can you do the single access TAVA with an e-sheath? No. <laughs> no. Explain no, why to everybody, please. Uh, no. We tried, but the, uh, the value of the, of the e-sheath is, is strong, and there are a border uh, of the sheet that uh, can't allow to puncture, and there are a lot of friction, but maybe it's a uh, it's, it's very difficult to do, and also we can do it with uh, with uh, Evolute and Evolute Pro because uh, you have inline sheet. So maybe it's a future develop for the e sheet to 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 allow to do that. <laughs> yeah, now I think it's just the the valve area is too tight, too, and too tight. small. That once you have the the commander delivery system through it, there's just no space, uh, and so you're not going to be able to put something next to it. Whereas with all these other devices the capsule is so much bigger than the shaft, right? It's similar to impeller. The reason this works with impeller and single access is because the impeller is so much bigger than the shaft. So whenever you have a delivery system with a sheath, with, a, with an expandable sheath, where the capsule is significantly bigger than the shaft, you can do this. That needs to be the kind of um, the, the baseline of what you have. A um, Couple of other questions here, Matthias. There's a few of you, I'm not, I'm not a believer in this, who are pushing single proglide with 14 French. Uh, I'm still a strong believer in two proglides. Um, but your comments, why did you go to a single proglide? Um, okay. First, it's a cost issue. Unfortunately, I have to say that it's a cost issue. Thank you. Uh, and, 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 and second, because... Uh, we do not have, but it, it has to be randomized, obviously, all we need data, but we, 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 we didn't have uh, complications uh, using one. Um, they, they, maybe the, the, the most important issue that if you always have to give at, at least a half dose of protamine, and there are patients that you don't want to use protamine. So in those patients, I, I recommend to use trupolize. But uh, in case of uh, failure of one uh, proglide, uh, it's easy to put uh, another proglide. But um, I, I don't want to recommend to use one proglide because uh, it's not the safer way to do that. I recommend to use do two proglides. Mm -hmm. But in, in, our, in our daily practice, we try to, 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 to use one in, for, for cost term. Also, we have found in some patients that we uh, use two proglides routinely that there are more uh, um, constrictions of the femoral artery. And in patients that we use one, we don't look this uh, type of constriction that are obviously not severe, but it's another point if you want to, to, to use one uh, to, to do it. Okay, excellent. Um... I'll just, Mark, we're still using two proglides here at Monty. Don't change, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's another couple of questions very quickly. Um, the mini would you also use a minimalistic approach in someone, for example, with chronic liver disease with low platelet counts? Um, but I think, it, I think that one is from Gerardo. And I think you remember Gerardo from Mexico City. Uh, yeah. He's a good friend. Uh, it's good to see you, Gerardo. Um, Hello, Gerardo. But, but I think it's all about the case selection again, don't you think, Matthias? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're not saying to be ultra minimalistic and send everybody home the next day um, because some of the patients we have are more complex than that and they may need a few more days in hospital. Yes, of course. Of course. And, and we, we have not to compromise the safety of the procedure. Always uh, try to, 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 to think about it. There are patients that are very good candidate for ultra minimalistic and uh, the low risk patient maybe are the best for this type of approach. Uh, but uh, when we think about high risk patient, very frailty, take care with this. With one complication, 
we can have a big, big, big uh, complication. So uh, try to 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 put uh, the safety first in, in all the procedures, and, and and that is as you say is the selection process. Ninety percent is selection, and ten percent is the the making the the, the procedure. Yeah, uh, I agree. I agree. I think you should. A lot of it is. I, I was just saying this to a colleague now that planning is the biggest, the most difficult part of a Java procedure, is the decision-making that happens before the procedure. Um, then there was a last question here for you, um, or two last questions. Um, do you routinely give protamine in your practice? Uh, depends, depends. If the patient has a previous PCI, uh, we try to do not use protamine. And also if it has a PCI in small vessels, and, and those patients we use to provide. And if we, there are any uh, bleeding during the first uh, uh, proglide, we do use half dose of protamine. We, we escalate. I, I say that with half dose of protamine is enough. So, you know, I'll, so respond, yeah. I'll respond uh, oh, it, oh. Uh, to Mohammed about what we do here in Monty. Um, so, Mohammed, we give routinely protamine. We, I have, for the last 10 years, been giving protamine after TAVA procedures. Um, we will not fully reverse, so we never give more than about 50 units, but usually it's somewhere between 30 to 50. Um, even if I do a TAVA and a PCI in the same procedure, I now give protamine, um, and we've not had an issue touch wood in... in probably the last 4,000 TAVAs that I've been aware of. So it's not been an issue for us. The one thing you have to be careful is, like I said, the dose. Um, give, don't give big doses, don't fully reverse. The only time I ever saw issues was when I first uh, moved to, to New York and we worked with anesthesiologists and one or two of them reversed, tried to reverse completely. Okay, the, the happened like they would in the OR and the patient became severely hypotensive. You know, we know you can get these protein reactions uh, if you give large doses or too quickly. But if you give small doses, it really just makes, you know, the amount of time you're compressing, the hematomas, the bleeding afterwards, the phone calls from the floor that your patient has a hematoma is oozing. It takes all of that away. Um, so we feel very comfortable uh, about using it. Uh, and you said, do you give it after you remove the big sheets or when exactly? I give it just before I start. I started as I'm about to remove the big sheath, Mohammed. Um, so basically, we've done with the procedure. I have my wire up the big sheath. My proglides are ready. I then start the protamine. And I ask for it to be given, and once it's at about 50%, I pull the big sheath. Um, and then, as I'm finishing the proglides, the protamine finishes. And like I said, we've not had any issues, even in patients who have um, who implant a stent in, uh, in their car room as long as you're careful with the dose. Um, there was one last question for you and then I'm gonna let you go, Matthias, uh, from Alessandra who asks, um, do you apply a minimalist approach to all the structural procedures in your department? And do you use any sort of, and this, this is very important, um, ECG telemedicine for continuous monitoring? To, to do minimalistic procedure in all uh, structural health, yes, that, the, the question is yes. Um, about the telemedicine, yes. In some patients that uh, this, uh, the insurance allow us, we do AQG telemedicine in his house, in the patient's house. We, we go with the house, we go to the house of the patient with the equipment and perform AQG. But uh, there are not a truly uh, system of telemedicine to 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 put in in his house. We have to go to the house to make the AQC. Yeah. So I'll tell you what what we do here in New York, uh, Matthias. So the one thing you know, um, I, I say to people, COVID, you know, obviously has been a horrible thing, but there's also been some silver linings with COVID and. I think you mentioned it in your practice, but even in our practice, it's forced us to streamline many things, right? So even like us, thanks to COVID, our length of stay is down. We try and streamline our procedures. We send a lot more patients home the same day. So I remember, you know, even things like PFOs, ASDs who come in, 
they go home the same day uh, just because we don't want to keep them in, in the hospital or put them on the floor. Um, so I, I thank COVID for that because I, it's, some, it's things that I thought that should be done and then COVID forced us to do it quickly. Um, so it is a silver lining. Um, we, as far as continuous monitoring, uh, Alessandra, we use a lot of it here in New York because um, we're also trying to push our patients home early. So if I have, and I have an example recently, two examples of patients. The one was the patient with, with baseline right bundle, okay? has no conduction issues in hospital. He's, we, keep, we kept him 48 hours in hospital. Okay, so we kept him with a, EC, with a pacemaker lead for the first 24 hours. So the next morning after Tava pulled the pacemaker lead, another 24 hours in hospital, no changes. We sent him home with an with a event monitor. Five days later, he went to complete heart block. Okay. And then last week, I had a second patient also, bifascicular block. I implanted a accurate one of the valves with the lowest pacemaker rates because of bifascicular block. No change to the ECG in hospital. Four days later, he goes into complete heart block after discharge. Uh, and because of the event monitor, we knew immediately, we called him, we said, please go to hospital, you need a pacemaker. And, and he lived two hours away from our hospital, right? So the event monitor probably saved his life. Um, so we've started, I've started using it a lot. I, Anybody who has new conduction disturbances like prolonged PR intervals, new left bundle branch block that's pretty wide um, and I send home, I put the event monitor on them. So we have these remote ones, you know, it's just a patch um, and, it, and with the transmitter, so it transmits to the company. Uh, and anybody with right bundle who doesn't get a pacemaker gets an event monitor. It's safer, life treating maybe, no? In yeah, I states. think it's safer. Also, you know, I think you said something very important. It's also about costs and what and what you're able to do with your resources, right? Uh, for you, you only, you know, it's almost cheaper for you with your resources to send your team to get an ECG at home than it is to put one of these. In New York, it's cheaper to do this, you know, and we have the resources to do it. Um, any last comments? That's it. Yeah, well, good job. Good job, and hope to see you soon. Uh, thank you for for being there. It's, it's very honor. It's an honor for us, for other Latin American physicians, to see you there, because you you have been pushing the the practice in Latin America to be uh, better, uh, better physicians, and to work uh, um, more with more confidence. So thank you for all things that you do for the Latin American interventional cardiology. I, I have to say that, honestly. And, Thank and you, also, mm -hmm. Asim, thank you for promoting this uh, conference that are very important for, for our proctors also in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matias. Thank you, Matias. Thank you for the friendship, and it's always good to see you, my friend. Hope to see you in New York soon. Or we come to Buenos Aires, one of the two. We'll do it next. <laughs>